Hello and welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm Alan Watke and um, thank you so much for joining us in this new format where we continue to bring you authors you love and their new books to the Politics and Prose community. Um, at any time during this event, you can click on the green button below um, to purchase tonight's book on Politics and Prose website. Um, we're currently offering free media mail shipping and our physical stores are closed and we do need your online pur uh, purchases to keep um, to keep us going and you know to to open our stores back up um, tonight we are able we are uh, you are able to ask the author a question by clicking on ask a question which is just below as well um, and you can um, also read other people's questions and vote on the ones you want to hear the most. A reminder that unlike our in-store events, the author, hosts, and audience members cannot see you through the screen. So feel empowered to stay in your pajamas without judgment. <laughs> um, finally, we want to thank you for being here with us tonight. We are so thankful to our family of loyal customers, keeping our businesses and our spirits afloat. Um, with, with that, I'm very thrilled to um, be here today with Karen Tanabe, um, celebrating her fifth book, A Hundred Sons. Karen is the author of The Diplomat's Daughter, The Gilded Years, uh, The Price of Inheritance, and The List. A former political reporter, her, her writing um, has also appeared in The Washington Post, the Miami Herald, Chicago Tribune, Newsday, among many others. And uh, she has made frequent appearances on a celebrity and uh, politics expert on Entertainment Tonight and um, the CBS Early Show, among others. I think her picture might have just gone out. Let me see. I think she's going to refresh right now. Uh oh. Hi. Yeah, there you are. Sorry. All right. Yeah, no, no, that was, that was good. Um, so yeah, I was just uh, just saying thank you for being here. And so um, everyone, please welcome Karen Tanabe to your screen. Hi, sorry about that. Um, my, who knows, who knows what's going to happen with this Wi-Fi, but I will try to stay here and stay sane. And I'm just going to start by saying welcome to my office. This is where the, uh, where the magic happens. Like, it's usually where I'm having like a mental breakdown. Um, but I feel very lucky to have this space right now because I come up here and hide from my family. And I come up here and try to write books. But I'm really excited that today I get to be here to talk about my fifth book, 100 Sons. Um, I've actually done every single book launch at Politics and Prose at the store with so many people I love around me. I remember saying for my first book that it felt like my wedding. Let me talk about it. It's called A Hundred Sons and it is historical fiction. It takes place in 1930s Andoshin, so in the fall of 1933. In 1930s, um, I'm sure you all know a lot about this, but I'll tell you anyway. It was a uh, it was a colony. It was a French colony uh, called Andoshin, and I have my main character Jesse Lesage, who is an American, but was born was born in America, but has a French Canadian mother, arrive. Oh, Karen, if you can hear me, I think you need to refresh again. Sorry, one second, folks. Mm -hmm. I do apologize for this inconvenience, these te technical difficulties sometimes. Let's see.
Did that work? There you are, yeah. Okay, JK, stay All with right. me. Well, we're gonna make this happen. Um, okay, back to the plot, I'll go quickly. So, it is about a woman named Jessie Lesage who is from Virginia and she was born really poor and kind of bootstraps her way up, becomes a teacher, moves to Paris, and plots to marry a Michelin heir like we all do. It works because she's got a lot of uh, chutzpah and she ends up moving to Vietnam in 1933 with her husband. And um, it is not really what she thinks it was going to be. And she's kind of looking for a friend in this world she doesn't quite understand. And Marcel, Marcel de Fabry is just a whole lot of fun. She uh, was a model in Paris and she married an older kind of wealthy guy and ends up living in Andochine. But she also has a very sexy lover named Hoi Win, who she met as a student in Paris. And they, um, they are kind of Jesse's introduction to this world. So on the one hand, we really have the story of friendship and love, but we also have power and greed as seen through the Michelin arm. And of course you have revenge and politics because this is 1933 and sort of in so, uh, were pretty ruthless. They had these horrible rubber plantations, which um, if you wanna be really depressed, you can go ahead and read about, or you can read about in my book. And um, they're obsessed with money. They're obsessed with making money as many of the colonial powers in Andochine were. So her husband's off doing that and she's off sort of introducing herself to the country, introducing herself to this expat community with Marcel de Fabry. So through them, you kind of see this whole colonial world and through Marcel's lover, Hoi Win, you see this wealthy Vietnamese world. So most of the country was impoverished. Um, they were being strangled by the French who were basically economically wiping everything out of their hands for their own gain. Um, but his family are colonial sympathizers and they own Karen. the silk, yes. I I'm sorry, um, it looks like we lost your picture. Could you refresh again? Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh. oh, no, I'm sorry. Did that work? Yeah, there you are. Okay. Yeah, I even did my hair. We can't lose my picture. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, so Hoi Wid is a big, rich silk heir. And with him, I'll just pause because one of the reasons I wanted to write him is because I wanted to write a really sexy kind of Asian great Gatsby. Um, and that's what I did with him. I really wanted to show, you know, a different side of a colonial book, not just like, oh, these white people go to this country and they, um, you know, get into God knows what opium and excess and everything. I really wanted to show that, um, there was a very different side of things. So through him, we see sort of the rich colonial uh, Vietnam. And then we see, you know, really the poor, more difficult side through the Michelin plantations. Um, so let me talk a little bit about why I, uh, why I decided to write this book. So firstly, um, I was kind of in a French mood. I had just had a child who was starting to talk and I really wanted to uh, make her fluent in French. So I put her in French school and I started speaking only French to her. And I kind of changed my brain patterns, honestly doing that. I, I started like kind of living this very French life in Washington DC. So I thought, okay, I'm going to write, um, 
a book with a French element. And when I decided to do that, I decided to look back on colonialization because I have a weird, weird isn't the right word. I, it's something I've thought a lot about and have thought of writing a lot about. I, as many of you know, I'm American, but my mom is from Belgium and my dad is from Japan, both two countries with kind of dreadful colonial pasts. And when I lived in Belgium, I lived um, pretty close to the Africa Museum, which, why is there an Africa Museum in Belgium? Because they colonized the Congo and it's a really weird place. I mean, it's sort of like King Leopold's I pillaged this from Africa Museum. And it really made a big impression on me because I had been to so many countries that had been colonized before, including Vietnam. And I really started thinking about the way that I traveled and saw these countries. I mean, I'll admit when I went to Vietnam, I loved the French Quarter. I was like obsessed with the French Quarter. I thought it was so charming. I loved that I could talk to people because they spoke French and shopping and eating and everything was so easy. Um, but now, sorry, I'm getting a text. Is it telling me that I cannot be heard? Refresh. Refresh again. Refresh. Can you all not see me? Hold on. Let me try. Sorry, I think I refreshed for no reason. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, you're good. It's, it's, okay. Yeah, um, you're good and clear. Well, thank you. For those of you who are still here, thank you for staying with me. Um, anyway, so I started thinking about my, the way I traveled and the way I thought about countries that had been colonized. Um, and I thought about, I thought about writing about the Congo and I have never been there and I didn't think I could do it authentically. So I thought about Vietnam because I love the country, I love visiting there, and I really was sort of mad at myself for how I had traveled in Vietnam, how I had approached the country. Um, but I thought I could write a good story there, and I really wanted to write a story with sexy Asian men and the European women who love them. Why did I want to write this story? Because uh, I was very inspired by my parents, by having an Asian father and having a European mother. So that was a, a really big part of, of wanting to do this. And also I really like, as many of you know, I really like writing about rich people behaving badly. I don't know why, I just do. Um, because maybe because I like reading about rich people <laughs> behaving badly, so. But I think, you know, all the rich attractive people often are white and I think that gets pretty boring. So I kind of try to turn things on the, their head a little bit by, giving you know different characters um characters of color some fun some sexiness uh and a lot of wealth to throw around you know that said most of vietnam at the time were peasants um having everything they had taken away by the french government so that's something i touch on a lot i call this book cocktails and communism in an interview and that kind of is what it is so you have something very serious with the, the political situation in Vietnam, and then you have sort of this fun thing. And then you have another element, um, which is the fact that my main character, Jessie Lesage, isn't 100% there in the head. She um, had a very difficult childhood, and sometimes you're not quite sure if she's a narr uh, reliable narrator or not. There's like a big obsession with unreliable narrators right now, and I didn't want to go there fully because I feel like it's being overdone at the moment, but she certainly has some moments where you're questioning uh, if you can trust her or not. And the narration in the book actually switches from Jesse to Marcel, who kind of become frenemies to put it in a millennial speak. So that's, uh, I, my last book was actually three different voices. So taking it to two different voices actually felt like a vacation. Um, I'm going to talk about research for this book because it was kind of intense. I was saying to Alan before I came on that I kind of wish I wrote books about girls walking on the beach who like meet very sexy men and call it a day because 
it would be easier <laughs> to research than the books I write. But um, that is not the case. I don't know why I put myself in these predicaments, but I do. So the first thing I did with this book is that I started reading a ton of French government documents. If you ever have trouble sleeping, email me. I will send you links to the French government documents. They are awful, but they were very helpful. Um, they're actually like tons of colonial documents scanned and online. So I was able to read a lot of the reports from the Michelin plantations. While I was doing this, I went down to check the tires on my car because if they were Michelin tires, I probably was going to have to spend $2,000 getting new tires. Luckily, they were not. Um, but really, it was atrocious, the conditions on the Michelin plantation. And I read a lot of like inspector general type work inspector reports of um, French government officials going down to the Michelin plantations and talking about very much about very particular things I was writing. So I read an entire book on the rubber industry in Vietnam. I read um, a really great memoir written by a plantation worker. And then I read a lot of stuff um, from the 30s to kind of get myself into, into that era. Um, which honestly, after writing a book, The Gilded Years set in 1897 was like a walk in the park, writing <laughs> language in the 30s. There's just a lot of more like hay sport, good old boy type things. Um, and then when I finished, I was honestly very happy with it, but I, I know that, I know that writing a book set in a place that is not your country and writing about a nationality that is not yours is very sensitive. And it's something that I've seen gone go wrong very often. I think a lot of us who are readers kind of know about the uh, American dirt controversy. Um, and this, I was writing this book way before, but I kind of finished and I was like, okay, I think, I think it's good. I think I'm in a good place. You know, my editor's pretty good. But I just felt like so I hired Nam, but an expert in Nam. So really this exact period of time when I was writing. And I talked to my friend Eleanor, who's a professor and hopefully watching, and she was like, don't stiff her, give her lots of money. So I offered her lots of money. And I said hey, to her- Hey, Karen, I'm sorry to jump in. Do you, yeah. do you mind refreshing again? No, can you not see me? No. Oh, sorry. No, you're okay. Sorry about that, folks. We'll get her right back. Okay. There she is. All right. Where was I? Lots of money. Um, yes. So anyway, on a serious note, I approached this woman and I said, you know, I've read so many books where something that I feel sort of belongs to me, Japan or Belgium or mixed race people or what have you is done badly or just a little badly. And I just don't wanna be that person. I don't wanna contribute anything to literature where I don't feel like I'm doing everything in my power to write respectfully about a place, about a people, about a time. So I had her read it and honestly, I think I'll probably do that with every single book. It just made it that much better. Um, she wasn't like, wow, this is horrible and you've offended everyone I've ever known. But she was like, yeah, here's a tiny nuanced thing about politics in Vietnam in the 1930s that you don't know and I'm gonna help you know. Um, and that was incredibly, incredibly helpful. I'm very grateful. And I also called and harassed all my friends who are of Vietnamese origin. <laughs> my friend Rachel Dugan, if you're watching, thank you, um, whose aunt uh, is Vietnamese, Rachel's half Vietnamese, who helped me a lot with the language. So I really, um, I really tried to make this book as 
authentic and as respectful as possible. And I think that's something uh, that I really care a lot about, that I really hope that more authors will do. And I think uh, maybe after the American Dirt controversy, people will. So I've talked about a lot of very serious things because that's kind of what it was in 1930s Vietnam. It was uh, an intense time where communism was forced to go underground and the country was really changing. But as I said, communism and cocktails bring us to cocktails. Kind of every book I write has a cocktail party. Actually, I should drink a cocktail. Um, here we go. I actually made two martinis. Um, yeah, every book I ever write somehow has a cocktail party in it. So my favorite scene is in uh, a flashback to the 1920s in Paris. And it's the first time that Jesse meets um, this guy, Sin Cao, who was Hoi's best friend in Paris. And they go to this crazy party and there are like half-dressed people and there's people drinking gin from a bathtub and there's um, a guy playing a mandolin, I think, and there's a monkey wearing a sweater with a matching hat. I have a thing for animals and clothing and I was really excited to be able to randomly insert a monkey wearing a sweater uh, into this book. So I am not a big reader during book talks because I feel like you're obviously all gonna buy this book and gonna read it yourself, but I was gonna read a little bit from that scene and then maybe we can open it up to questions and hopefully you won't lose me again. Let me just drink a lot of this. Oh. Gin, intense. Okay, so. Um, in this scene, we're in Paris and it's the 1920s and uh, Marcel and Hoy are very much falling in love and he takes her to meet his kind of his people. Let's see. Um, so Jesse's talking about about the friend about um, Sin Cow. Um, she says, why have you kept him hidden away? And Koi says, it's you I've been keeping hidden. The last thing I need is for Sin to fall in love with you. And how could he not? He said, squeezing my hand. But I ran into him yesterday and he told me that he was mad for a French girl named Anne-Marie de la Chambre, a fellow student and a bit of a rabble rouser from how he described her. He asked me to stop over tonight to help convince her to fall in love with him. Maybe you should have drunk less last night than I said as we exited the taxi. No, I'm fine, and he will be too. You'll see. It's actually very hard not to fall in love with sin. Hey, Karen, can you hear me? Hey, sorry about that. It looks like we need to have her refresh again real quick. Let's see. Yes. Yeah, there you go. How are y'all? Uh, Sorry about that. Okay, and I lost my space, so I'm not going to read from the book. I'm just going to tell you more about the party. Um, I think we should open this to Q and A because honestly, I I'd rather hear your questions than to just talk at the screen. So no, that that totally works. Okay, yeah, and uh, yeah. I think you should all read that scene because obviously it's great. And if you don't want to read a book with a monkey wearing a sweater, then who are you? <laughs> Right, absolutely. Um, no, I didn't. Jennifer Mar oh yeah, yeah. Get your drink, please. Oh, all right. And for um, those of you, for those of you who have stayed with me through all our technical difficulties, thank you. I owe you a drink, IRL. <laughs> um, 
So uh, Jennifer Martinez asked if you could share research you did for the book. Uh, P.S. This is so fascinating. I think you went over that a little bit. Jenny, um, yeah. thank you for being here. Jen and I worked at Politico together um, and nice. she has really good hair. I'm trying to channel your hair, Jen. Um, research. So, I mean, it's, you know, honestly, I couldn't have written this book if I didn't speak French. So thanks, mom, if you're watching. Um, I did most of my research in French, probably 80% in French. And most of it was government documents. And I use a lot of them verbatim, like translated but verbatim in the book because they were so appalling. I mean, the way they used to inspect these Michelin plantations is they would they would tell them they were coming. So like, I just literally spilled gin all over my pants, but it's fine. They knew people were coming and they still found all these people like in different states of death everywhere, you know, hidden away. They would transport them out so like the authorities couldn't see them, but they saw dozens, you know, dozens of people dying. And it's like, wow, you knew they were coming and it was this bad. I mean, it was it was atrocious. So I use a lot of that stuff verbatim. Um, and then I think first person accounts are the best way to write historical fiction. So any memoir or diary or anything you can find of people who were there and lived through these things is the best thing you can do. Um, and then you make up a bunch of other stuff and hope that it can kind of mesh together. Mm, tie it all together. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you. Um, Jennifer says, Karen, what book project do you desperately want to write, but you feel you need to have more or different experiences to take on? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, well, I mentioned I wanted to write a book about the Congo. I'm, I'm very, well, about Belgium and the Congo and sort of that very uh, fraught relationship, but I have never been to the Congo, so I, I don't feel like I could do it now. There's some things I've started to write that like you just feel like you're doing badly. I once tried to write something set in the South and whew, so bad. Uh, I am a very bad Southern writer. So I, I just don't want that to happen. So I would definitely have to go there and spend a lot of time there. Um, I really want to set a book set, set like in the, write a book set in the 90s in Tokyo. And I was also thinking of writing a book set in the EU, kind of like a Auberge Espagnol, if anyone has seen that movie, sort of like a kind of young and crazy EU people with some scandal thrown in, because I used to live right by the EU. So we'll see. Of course, this said, I had lunch with a guy who is a TV writer, and he was like, if you actually want to sell books, set everything in New York. So my next book is set in New York, people. Right. Mom is going to drink. And then Amy says, hi, Karen, other than a hundred sons, what is your stay at home reading list? And Amy. hope everyone is healthy and safe. Yes, Amy, your picture is on my wall, just right above here. Um, I actually have, I keep a stack in my office of books that I'm currently reading. So oh, let's drag this over. I'm glad I used a wheelie chair. This is a really cool comic book that my friend, comic book, it's a graphic book that my friend Jim Dugan just sent me. Um, thank you, Jim Dugan, you're so nice. I can't wait to dive in. I'm really into things that are funny right now. So I'm reading Trevor Noah's uh, book. It's really great because I feel like I have to laugh because I have toddlers and right now I'm crying. <laughs> uh, I'm reading Fran Leibowitz's book because she's so funny. I turn back here a lot when I want to laugh. And it makes me feel like I'm in New York. Um, oh, I'm reading Ann Patchett again, Val Canto. If anyone hasn't read this, they're stuck in a room with mean people and guns. So this is uh, reminds me that my life is less bad than this, but the book is very good. And yeah, another funny book is Less that I really, really like. It's a won the Pulitzer, I think, in 18, don't hold me to it, 17, 18. Um, and he travels all around the world, which I really like too. So it's funny and it's it's travel-y. So that's, yeah. of course I'm on deadline, so you know, reading is what it is. Right. Yeah, like you said, you're sticking, uh, sticking with the humor right now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. humor and alcohol. Uh -huh. um. Um, Amy says, um, 
Hi, Karen. I'd love to know the toughest part of writing this book. And now that you've written so many books, do you have a favorite? Is this Amy I.E.? Uh, Parnes. Parnes! Mm -hmm. um, Amy Parnes is my forever work wife from Politico. I, I forgot the question because I was just excited. To oh, no, that's, that's not. <laughs> the toughest part. Um, yeah, the, the toughest part of writing the book. And now that you've written so many, which one is your favorite? Or do you mm -hmm. have a favorite? I think your favorite should always be the book you've just written. I think if it's not, something's wrong, you know? Um, the toughest part of writing a book for me will always be the first draft. First drafts are hell. If anyone tells you different, they're lying. I usually like get hideous, gain 10 pounds, cry, don't sleep, complain to all of you constantly. Um, because I always tell people it's like drawing an outline, like of the Mona Lisa, or I'm not saying what I write is the Mona Lisa, but like a pencil drawing before you paint everything in, you know, and that's just going from nothing to something and that something being nearly 400 pages is, is awful. After that, you feel like you're fiddling and fixing and you have other people helping you and that's way more fun. Um, and favorite, I mean, the book I just wrote coming hopefully in 2021 is probably the most personal book I've ever written. Uh, and when my editor sent me her letter back, I started to cry, it was so, well, I cried because she liked it. <laughs> and then I cried because it was a very, very personal book. So hopefully y'all will like that one. But I like this one too, don't get me wrong. I think, uh, I think, I think this one really is about a place in time we don't hear much about. And I think that's important. As much as I enjoy, you know, historical fiction books set in World War II, I've, I feel like there's a lot. And 1930s Vietnam, not too much. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you. So Georgia says, hi, Carr. Uh, you do a really good job of maintaining a balance between uh, being sensitive about the subject matter without being too serious. What part of the expat community during this time was most fun for you to recreate? Oh, thanks, G. Um, you know, I, I, I invented, kind of invented this officer's club in the book. And there were many, I copied it off a British one in Burma. And I, you know, expats, expats, let's call them colonizers. Colonizers were sort of awful because they just wanted to stay in their little world and not actually see anyone in the country that they were, you know, pillaging. Um, but they built some nice buildings. And so I make this this really beautiful place where Marcel and Jesse kind of become friends. And I have one scene where they're at this like very fabulous dinner and they go off together to explore and they find a passageway behind a wall in the hotel, sort of the hotel area where the men are allowed to go and they go spy on everyone. And one person is like a government, uh, high up government official who's butt naked. And it was a really fun scene to write. <laughs> so, um, I mean, you know what? If I was in a bookstore, I probably wouldn't be drinking martini and saying butt naked. So this has a lot of quotes, y'all. I may have disappeared like eight times, but this is this is fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Um Amy, uh Claire Amy says, Would you ever write a novel in French? Oui, bien sûr, <laughs> uh, well, this book is going to be uh, now my brain is in French. I can't speak English. This book is going to be translated into French. So I'm really excited about that because I've never been able to read uh, one of my translations. The only other language I speak is French. So I'm really excited to read this in French. Um, I would love to. My French is, you know, I'd like to think extremely good, but it's not exactly uh, to the level of my English. So I might need a little help from my mom, but mm -hmm. I... Uh, I would like to. I mean, France and Belgium and the Francophone world are such a giant part of my life that that I really I would like to go that way one day. Hmm. I would have to drink less of these, but I'd do it. And then um, Kendra asks, did you tell the Michelin family you were writing this <laughs> book? Kendra! <laughs> um, hi, Kendra. Uh, no, no, I did not. Uh, maybe they'll email me, who knows? Mm -hmm. 
I, uh, but you know, I did go on their website a lot. They were probably like, wow, we have an excessive interest in rubber from Washington, D.C. But, um, and I was very upset that they never mentioned these plantations in Vietnam on their website. You know, they mentioned like what was happening at that time, but they don't mention where they were actually getting their wealth. Um, and I know there's a lot of companies, obviously, who have shady pasts. It's not like they're the, I'm sure Firestone was no walk in the park either. But um, it really made me think about owning up to your past, you know, like it was very strange to see it completely washed out on their history sections. Um, so if, Michelin, if you're listening, you may want to add in the atrocities of Vietnam. Right. Um, and Mary Alice says, uh, first, hi, Karen. First question. Uh, how do you, uh, how do you look so fab in quarantine? And secondly, what was the most fascinating thing you found in your research that didn't make it into the book? Hmm. Okay. Amazing. Mary Alice, you're on the wall right there of us graduating from college. Um, how do I look just good in quarantine? Girl, you of all people, a little, a little judge to the hair, putting on like 18 pounds of makeup. Um, I, I, I had to do my roots myself. Who knows what they look like close up. But I'm trying, I'm trying to, to keep it together during quarantine and not gain the COVID-19. Um, what did I learn during my research that I didn't use? Ooh, a lot. I mean, you know, it's, it's hard to find a balance between talking about something as horrible as life on a rubber plantation and also being like, hey, this is a fun book. Like you all should really pick this up. Like it's not just about people dying in terrible conditions. Um, so, and also I think I had to get a very big picture of Vietnamese history before I could hone in on just a few months. So I, I learned a lot about you know, the French involvement in Vietnam in the first place and about um, just sort of the progression from the French colonizing it all the way to the Vietnam War, which is obviously a very uh, large amount of time. So I think what I had to do was learn a ton to focus on a very little uh, time period. That said, I've forgotten everything, so don't ask me about anything. <laughs> Moving on to the next question. Yeah. Um, all right. Chelsea says, what author would you love to have a cocktail with? Oh, Chelsea, I want to have an artist cocktail with you. Chelsea is an amazing chalk artist. Um, ooh. Okay. Kevin Kwan, who wrote Crazy Rich Asians, obviously, I think is my best friend waiting to happen. Um, what else? Uh, oh, I'm going to butcher his name, Amor Tolls, Tals, Tal, Tal, yeah. Tal, um, who wrote The Rules of Civility, which is one of my favorite books, Rich People Behaving Badly, mm -hmm. uh, I think would be really fun. Um, ooh, I'd love to have a cocktail with Fran Leibowitz because she's crazy mm -hmm. in the best of ways. Um, and who else? You know, I like I like funny authors. <laughs> I just feel like some people take what we do too seriously. And that mm -hmm. doesn't interest me very much. So yeah, people who I could have a martini with and tell a few bad jokes. That'd be amazing. Fantastic. Uh, Kendra says, as someone who fantasizes about buying a Honda Dream and moving to Hanoi, I'd love to know what real life places are going to we are going to see in this book tips for future travel when we get oh, out of this. Okay. So, you know, a lot of the places I write about are no longer there because it changed so much, but there is a really, probably one of my favorite scenes is on Halong Bay, um, which I took maybe two or three trips to Halong Bay and slept on the boat and it was incredible. So I knew I wanted to set something there. Um, that's probably one of my, favorite places in the world, honestly. And, you know, there are a lot of sort of French era hotels in the book, which after I gave my spiel on traveling differently in places that are colonized, you should not go there and you should only go to places that are authentically Vietnamese. Um, 
but they are there. And honestly, I think one of the ways you really travel in this book uh, is through the food. There's really good food in this book. And I don't know how you all are eating right now, but I'm eating terribly. I'm so sick of cooking. Um, my food is garbage. And one of the ways I'm really enjoying traveling is by reading about food. So I think hopefully that'll help transport you a little and hopefully we'll all be able to travel soon. Yeah. And then Deb Bruno says, I love the fact that you brought a cocktail into this. Deborah, you know, I have to, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, just in case, just in case. I'll level with this question. Yes. Was there a question? <laughs> there, no, no, that was just just throwing love, you know. Deborah Bruno, yeah. I love you too. Thank you. Yeah. And Megan says, you are so amazing. Oh, where'd it go? I cannot, I cannot wait to read this in quarantine. With so many books under your belt now, what is different about this one for you, your process, and where do you keep finding the creativity? Um, Megan, I'll send you a check after this. Is, I can't really send you a check. I'll send you cash. Uh, I'm going to steal this drink. Um, well, first of all, thank you. That's incredibly kind. You know, I, I have... I never have a lack of ideas. I have a lack of like ability to execute, I think, honestly. There's a, a million things I wanna write. I just, uh, I forget how hard it is to do it every time I start. So this idea like honestly sounded great on paper when I first proposed it in two pages. And then I started to write it. And like, again, I was like, what have I done to myself and why have I done this? I mean, which is exactly what I said with The Diplomat's Daughter, which I wrote before this, I was like, why Why is this so hard? Why do I have to make things so complicated? Um, but I think honestly, I'd get a little bored if I just wrote Girl on the Beach with Dog. Watch out, that's gonna be my next book, Girl on the Beach with Dog. <laughs> but um, I really, I think I enjoy books with a lot of elements. I enjoy reading books like that. So I end up writing them. So yeah, ideas, you know, I think a lot about what's missing? I read a lot, like we all do. And I'm like, what am I not reading? You know, like a girl uh, in front of window on bed in car with like who done it? I'm very sick of reading and I don't want to write that. So yeah, I do think about kind of what's out there and what's missing and then sort of think about filling a void. This is probably stupid and I should write girl at window with mystery because I would have a way nicer office, but. You know, what are you going to do? <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see. Megan Carroll says, congrats, Karen. Um, you did, uh, oh, you, did you base any of the characters on people that you read about in the historical documents? Megan, they're all based on you, girl. Just yeah. Uh -huh. and, uh, <laughs> Did any real people inspire the characters? You mentioned part of the inspiration coming from your own parents' love and marriage. Yeah, um, well, that's such a sweet question. I, I mean, I, you know, I very much wanted to do a relationship and I have two couples in the book who are a Vietnamese man and a French woman. And I kind of wanted to do these unapologetic interracial relationships. I feel like so many times you read about these things in books and it's like, oh, he's so different than anyone I'd ever met or she was so exotic or I was so intrigued by her like different nature. And I'm just like, this is ridiculous. Like this is not actually how life happens. Like you actually just fall in love with someone because of who they are or your animal attraction to them or what have you. Um, and I wanted to write characters like that in the book. So I never really go, I don't talk about race that much, honestly, because it's not something that I, in my life growing up, talked about. It's not like we sat around and like, analyzed our family, you know? Um, so my parents, I'd say, inspired me in sort of the very nature of, of relationships. And then no, no like particular person inspired my characters. I will say I did think Jay Gatsby a little bit for Hoy Win because He's fabulous and rich and has a boat and he's very sexy. Um, but I didn't have any other real people. Well, not that Jay Gatsby's real. I mean, I have a few more of these and he will be, but um, 
But I think in every one of my books, I have a funny sort of sidekick. And Marcel de Fabry is definitely that funny sidekick. I just, I cannot not write a funny sidekick, y'all. Just like, I cannot not write a cocktail party. So it's there. Yeah. All right. So there's quite a few questions here. And, okay. and yeah, just and a ton of comments just saying you're doing such an amazing job and just giving you love. And so that's coming. great, right? Um, <laughs> uh, Lauren says, um, where did you, where did your love of writing historical fiction come from? Is there one particular book that made you fall in love with those stories? Huh, that's a good question. You know, I didn't start writing historical fiction. I my very my first two books were not historical fiction. They were upmarket contemporary fiction, as we say in the industry. Um, but I've I read a lot of historical fiction. One of the first books I ever like read as an adult, adult being like 13, was Marjorie Morningstar by Herman Wook, which uh, is a sort of a coming of age story in New York and um, set in like the 30s, 40s. And it had an enormous, it made an enormous impression on me. I was actually very in love with uh, the male love interest, Noel Ehrman. He was very moody and wore a black turtleneck and played the piano. And I remember that being one of the first books I ever loved. Um, and I really love to read historical fiction, but I wasn't that drawn to writing it until I wrote my third book, uh, The Gilded Years, which if you haven't read, I highly recommend. But um, when I started writing that book, which is set in 1897, I was like, wow, I love researching. You know, I complain, obviously, a lot, even alone, drinking with all of you. But um, I do, I was a journalist. Many people here who have asked me questions worked with me at Politico. And I think sort of that itch to, to research really works with historical fiction. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Rebecca says, hi, Karen. Uh, Sheila Frankel wants to know what inspires <laughs> all of these well, uh, romantic entanglements. Congratulations on another amazing book. Oh, thank you. Um, what inspires romantic entanglements? You know, it's funny. I have a, I never know like how deep to go in the romance, you know, because I feel like I'm not a full on romance writer, but it's always nice to have to have something there. I mean, I think it's just one of the human elements that really interests me is who we fall in love with, why we fall in love with them and the lengths we will go for love. I mean, The Diplomat's Daughter, which I wrote about has in my last book, has people spread out on different continents still trying to find each other during war because they love each other so much. And now I have people so in love, they're you know willing to have affairs and do crazy illegal things and risk their lives. And, you know, I think, uh, I think that's a really fun thing for me to explore. So I'll probably keep doing it. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, do. Um, all right, let's see. So it's going very quickly. Anna, Anna <laughs> says, do you have any fun rituals or celebration traditions when you finish a book or when it launches? Oh, well, you know, this is a launch. <laughs> this is uh, this is officially my book launch. The book comes out in two days. It's funny. When I finish a book, there is such a strange sense of relief. I mean, when I finish a first draft, let's say, because that's always the hardest part. And I'll usually just like, first I have to like sh I know, pluck my eyebrows because I've grown like horns and I look insane. And then I, um, and then I like re-enter the world. I mean, I usually wake up at four or five in the morning when I'm, actively writing a book. So I'll sleep in to like seven. And then I'll try to spend a day like not in front of a computer. So last time I finished the book and I could have leave the house, I went and saw a movie by myself. I had brunch, I read the paper. I bought a lot of pants that didn't really fit, but will fit one day. And just like hung out with my brain for a while. And, and it was really fun. Um, and then when the book comes out, I've had this tradition that me and my friend Jamilia always go buy it together and we can't do it this year. So I'm really sad, but um, we usually buy it and drink champagne. So this is, you know, I'll buy it from politics and pros, which I recommend you all do. And I'll drink 
these two martinis and get excessively wasted. That's right. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, who do some overlooked French or Belgian novelists that you wish people knew better? And yeah. um, would you ever translate one into English? Yeah, I could translate into English. I couldn't translate the other way. Um, so I feel like all French Belgian authors are, unless you're like Emile Zola, are overlooked in the United States. Um, I read, reread a lot of Marguerite Duras, Marguerite Duras, uh, in American pronunciation, who is a French writer who grew up in Nendoshin, and she wrote a book called The Lover, which is also a very steamy movie, which I highly recommend. Um, and the love interest is a Asian man, he was Chinese, there was a large Chinese population at the time uh, in Vietnam. So I reread a lot of her work and it's excellent. Um, Marguerite Yourcenar, Marguerite Yourcenar, I like, cannot say it in, about the Yourcenar, but uh, it's a Belgian writer I really like. Um, Amélie Nothomb is another Belgian writer who actually lived in Japan, who I read a lot of. Um, and then for like easy breezy French lit, I'll read like Mahlovi because it's fun. So feel free to email me and ask mm. me. If I can spell these things. Um, Jim says, I've heard it said that books are never finished, just abandoned. Do you agree or do you feel like you reach a point where you're happy with what you've written? Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. I kind of agree. I mean, I only finish a book because I have to, you know, because I have people telling me to stop or that they'll take back my money and I got to like buy cool jewelry that I can wear and these things. So, um, it's funny though. I finished this book, this cover I love so much. And after I spoke to, uh, the professor I consulted, she suggested I add an epilogue to kind of show how the political situation changed 20 years later and what would have happened to my characters, especially the moneyed uh, Vietnamese. So I ended up at sort of the very end, like when I still had a week left, adding an epilogue to this book. And I think it's one of the strongest parts of the book. I'm really glad she, she suggested it. I'm um, so a book I thought was finished, I ended up adding another chapter to. Um, Am I still there, Alan? Ooh, yeah, you're. Yeah, why don't you refresh real quick? Sorry, y'all. Yes. There, yeah. Oh, now you're frozen though. Maybe. Can you hear me? Why don't you try and refresh one more time? Kind of. How's that? Almost, I can hear you, but we want to no. see you. Sorry, one second. No, I can't see you. Let me. I don't know. Um, why don't you refresh it again? Oh, wait. There you are. Yes. Yeah, there we go. I'm cursing with this. <laughs> Excuse me for all the f bombs I've been dropping while this doesn't work. You are good. Um, so why don't we why don't we do one one last question? Okay, let's do one last question. Um, answer the last question. I don't remember. Yes. Yeah. Um, so let's see. What other authors are you friends with, and how do they help you become a better writer? Oh, that's amazing. Well, I have a lot of authors who've asked questions. Uh, during this Q&A, Rebecca Frankel wrote a really good book called War Dogs. Amy Parnes wrote two amazing books on Hillary Clinton. 
one being Shattered, the other one being HRC. My friend Victoria Kelly, I think, is on, wrote Mrs. Houdini, uh, a fiction book. Um, lots of people here who I'm probably forgetting. But, you know, honestly, let's be dead honest, the best reason to have author friends is to have someone to complain to who understands what you're going through. I mean, that sounds silly, but it, it's true. Because I'll like complain to my husband and he's like, that's nice. Can you pick up the kids at 3 p.m.? And I'm like, I'm dying. <laughs> like, you don't understand. I hate you. Um, and to have someone to talk to who knows like exactly what it's like to turn out a first draft is amazing. Mm. And then um, I have a lot of author friends read for me and they'll tell me honestly if something is terrible. I mean, I think the good thing about having been a journalist, especially at Politico, is that you're pretty good with criticism. I mean, I like all criticism, honestly, before the book comes out, after, mm -hmm. not so much. But before, I love when people can help me make it better. Um, so I think having author friends is amazing. Plus mm. they're fun and they're creative and smart and I just love all those people. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, well, thank you so much, Karen. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you. It was, it was so good having you. Oh, thank you. Like, I apologize to everyone for how many times I had to refresh this screen. Oh, it's I'm, all right. It, I think I it ended up being it ended up being great. Okay. And we we're we we're able to have the, the PMP Live virtual event launch for your book, and it, which is available if you on this button right here. Um, a hundred sons. Actually, you can purchase that and her backlist, like all of her other books as well. You can order all at the same time. Um, so thank you so much. Um, your your patronage is what enables us to bring your programming like this, and we cannot continue to host these types of events without um, the book sales to support them. Um, so please support Karen and uh, Politics and Prose by buying a hundred sons. Um, using that, hundred, hundred sons. Uh huh. That's right. A hundred, a <laughs> hundred sons. Um, and then also, um, just above, you'll see the politics and prose um, emblem, and next to it says follow. You can click on follow and see what events we have coming up. Um, we have a whole list of events coming up, so please do um, tune in to all of those. And um, we want to thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Thank you, Karen. That was fantastic. Thank and you all so much. I miss you. I wish I could see you in person. I'm buying you all drinks when we can finally leave our houses. So stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you to Alan. Please buy a book from Politics and Prose. It's such an amazing store. And thank you for listening to me babble somewhat drunk by the end in uh, fits and starts. It was worth doing my hair for this. Absolutely. It was so great having you. Thank you all. And uh, stay well read. Stay well read. Mm -hmm.